Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 55 of the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet with the neatest people in the industry. In this episode of the podcast, I speak on location in Seattle, Washington at Jack Straw Studio with clarinetist Marianne Lakai. We discuss her playing and teaching career, her upbringing as a clarinetist, and what she loves about Ubel clarinets and ESM mouthpieces. I would like to thank Mo Bleichner Music Distribution for making this studio interview possible, and I look forward to sharing an interview I had with Andreas and Victoria about their products on the next episode. Of course, I would also like to thank those listeners who are doing their Amazon shopping at www.clarinet.com slash support. I really cannot stress how easy this is. You simply go to that website, click the appropriate country. There's now Canada, the US, and the UK listed on there. You go to the page, you do your shopping as normal. It doesn't cost you a penny extra, but the podcast actually gets between 4 and 8% commission, which is just fantastic. I'm putting these funds towards traveling for the trip, covering the costs of running the website, and I hope to get to a point, honestly, where I can invest more of my time in this. I really do love producing the show every week. It's such a great privilege, and it would just mean so much if you would take that extra moment and click that link before doing your Amazon shopping. Also, I want to let you know that for a few months, the uh, apparel on the website was out of stock. I had no shirts or anything left. I've hooked up with a new company called Printful, which is actually going to fulfill those orders for me. So if you're the kind of person who you'd like to support the show, but you'd also like something to show for it, you can head on there and there's about five or six different t-shirt designs now you can check out in various sizes, in women's sizes, and even in like tank tops. There's also some stickers, pins, um, there's a coffee mug. And I'm adding more and more things every day as I think of it and have time to put it up there. So feel free to check that out as well. That's www.clarineat.com slash support. One more quick thing before we get started is that Marianne has actually sent me a recording of her playing the ESM mouthpiece and the Ubel clarinets, which we're discussing in this interview and the next podcast episode. And in that video, I've included some close-up shots that you can actually check out how this mouthpiece looks. It's really cool. It has some sort of blue uh, synthetic crystal design with sort of some flecks of silver uh, aluminum, I believe, in the uh, the mouthpiece, mouthpiece itself. It's a really cool mouthpiece, needless to say, and uh, she sounds fantastic playing on it. So I invite you to check that out for the show notes at episode 55 at clarinet.com. And now I bring you Marianne Lakai after a brief message from our sponsor, Daria Woodwinds. Thanks again for listening. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Daria is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Daddario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com slash woodwinds. So I'm here today with Marianne Lakai in, uh, in the heart of Seattle. We're in the University of Washington campus, and we're at a studio, actually, called Jack Straw Studios. So welcome to Clarinet, Marianne. Thank you, Sean. Good to be here. And thank you also, we should mention, to our engineer today, Joel, in the in the booth. It's uh, We're taking things to yes. the next level Hi, Joel. here. <laughs> <laughs> So to start off, I mean, you're quite an active clarinetist in the Seattle area and actually around the whole world. It says uh, you've been in t- to 26 countries in your bio. So first of all, tell me a little bit about that. Like, what's it like to sort of be a globetrotting clarinetist in that way? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I do about 80% of my uh, clarinetting uh, on the computer. I'm a researcher. Mm-hmm. And um, now that I've achieved all my my technical facilities. I spend a lot of time reaching out and marketing. So I, I'm kind of a marketing strategist, um, writing letters, communicating with universities, performance halls, uh, v- events, venues all over the world. Um, out of all the hours I spend, uh, I probably get around three to four bites a year, but they're worth it. 
and I set up all my tours toward the end of the year. So I book myself out around six to seven months in advance. Oh, wow. So I have plenty of time to set up the contracts and finalize everything before I get on the plane and travel. Um, one of the things that I enjoy is it allows me for the indulgence to see a different country, meet people, walk the streets, breathe the air, talk with the the the, the individuals, get to know the people, and feel the pulse of the city rather than just getting off the plane and going into a concert hall um, and playing with string quartets or, or whatever I'm, I'm doing at the time. That feels, um, to me, a more important as far as learning the music and getting a, a feel for what I'm going to do um, rather than just a cold walking in the door and, and, you know, setting up like. Um, so the actual indulgence itself of the city involved with the playing of what if I'm doing the Brahms Quintet or, or whatever um, helps to em- kind of enhance my mm-hmm. experience. And uh, so that's kind of the excitement of that. So you say you spend 80% of the time kind of marketing. Do you mean like marketing yes. yourself as a player to events? and it, Or is that the extent of things that are are kind of approved. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Okay. Um, well, I um, I reach out with feelers, and uh, I do have a manager, okay. um, Patricia Alberti, artists in Arizona. They do a lot of stuff for me in the Pacific Northwest and around the immediate region. Mm-hmm. Uh, she does not book me internationally. That's something that I do on my own. But once I've traveled to a country, Um, I usually get invited back for a master class uh, or something down the road somewhere. So it kind of um, emanates. It starts with one thing and it builds next, 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 and it builds up. Um, So the perfect example of that would be um, three years ago I was at the University of Auckland and we recorded the Gadoni Clarinet Concerto. Mm-hmm. And the year later, after that, I got invited back to do a master class, which is really exciting. And um, then I got um, feelers out for Sydney. So the following year, <laughs> I was I was at the conservatory and uh, played with the Emerson String Quartet. Oh wow! And that was an amazing experience. Or awesome artists. So it's um, it's quite That's crazy. A, crazy. So you know, one of the things I've tended to focus on, because it's one of my interests, I guess, is sort of the business of music and, and marketing oneself. I think it's really interesting to hear that you're you're doing so much of that. Because um, a lot of people, I think, they sort of expect that, you know, if I practice X amount, then one day someone will call me and then I'll go somewhere. But are you saying it's kind of the opposite? You have to sort of put out the feelers and meet people and network. And, exactly. And, and my, advice to, my advice to those young players out there is start thinking about that early. Mm-hmm. Um, because someday you're going to graduate and you're going to be sitting by the phone and nothing's going to happen. Yeah. So getting your name out there, don't be afraid to go up and introduce yourself, tell them who you are, tell them what you've accomplished. Um, marketing in this world is what it's all about. It moves the world, moves the country, and that's yeah. what the pulse is, and that's with music, uh, athletics, or whatever have you. Well, it's funny how serendipitous things can be because, like, even this trip, I mean, I plan to come out to Seattle, and and uh, Marianne and I actually meant to chat, I think, around December we were first going to, or we first started the dialogue of having a dialogue right. Right. upcoming anyways. And uh, the week before my trip, we were about to um, have our Skype call, and I, I suddenly realized, like, wait a second, like, you're you're in Seattle. Like, I'm going to be in Seattle. Like, let's do this. And yeah. so, and that's, you know, led to some other interesting, like, it's nice to actually meet face-to-face and have this interview instead of over Skype, of course, but it's funny how, you know, we put the feelers out there for the networking stuff and things do happen, you know, so it's really good to be here. Um, as far as your your average sort of day or week, like what does that look like? What does your life entail here in Seattle when you are? When I'm, well, <laughs> when when I'm here. Here, here in Seattle. Um, I do have 38 students that I oh, wow. teach. Um, most of them are online. Uh, the others, I travel to their homes. Mm-hmm. and do one-on-one lessons. What percentage are online versus? I have over 20 online. Wow. And is that through Skype or how does that work? Um, that is through various uh, clarinet tutoring websites. Oh, okay. And uh, how is example- that? Because I, I remember, I'm oh, sorry, you were about to say. Oh, I was, no, go ahead. Go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> I talked to um, a few people about this. That a few people are offering Skype lessons now. It's kind of becoming a thing. And in a way, I think it's kind of cool because you can, you're not confined by your location. 
someone who lives in Antarctica could study with someone in New York City, for example, as long as they can get their schedules synced together. But I imagine there are challenges, too, with it. So what, what's your experience been? How does it work? Well, it all depends on which um, agency you, you get involved with. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on the Zen, which is very good. Uh, there's a list of quite, quite a large list of others that you can get involved with. Again, it's spending time marketing. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to any of your viewers out there. I could give you a list or partial list if you're interested, contact Sean, mm-hmm. and I'd be able to get you started on that. Um, the The other thing that's really important is um, how you write up your bio and how you portray yourself. Your profile mm-hmm. is very important. Um, what advice would you have in that regard specifically? Be as wordy as you can. As don't wordy le- as possible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> don't leave anything out. Um, get a good Photographer, um, get a good profile picture, um, one that you're looking straight ahead, mm-hmm. uh, no side views. Those are uh, kind of shady, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's mine. No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, people look for honesty. They look for integrity. Yeah. Uh, they look for shades of – it's either black or white. There's no shades of gray. And if a musician comes across as being, well – I'm here, but I'm not here, and and it doesn't it doesn't look quite upfront. Then go the other direction. Mm-hmm. So I've spent my entire life um, being upfront and honest with people, and this is me. You either love me or you hate me, yeah. and uh, that's that's where that's where I am right now. With your students, what is the primary like takeaway you you like to sort of give them or sort of impress upon them as your as your student? Well, um, I'd like to say that um, after a student has studied with me for a few years that I own that student. (laughs) And um, I have several top students now that are in Seattle Youth Symphony Orchestras, all playing first clarinet. So that's something I'm real proud of, uh, these kids' accomplishments. Um, When I walk into a student for the first time, they, they get the feeling of, this woman's going to put me to work. This this woman's going to make me work. It's a serious stuff. Um, I've had many students that have I've started with, and a couple three weeks later, they're out the door. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it's just the way life is. You're either going to make it as a clarinetist, or we're not going to work together. Yeah, I want to expand on that a little bit because I, I've heard this philosophy. Like some teachers are very serious about the teaching and the process and whatever, and. In a way, I want to side with that. But I also understand the perspective that not everyone's going to be a principal clarinetist of an orchestra. Some people just do it for pleasure. So are you saying you like to focus on the ones that are going to pursue a career and that those other students are best to go to someone else? Um, Yes, pretty much, Sean. Um, I focus my energies because I put so much. It is just unbelievable Mm -hmm. the amount of time, effort, um, letter writing on their behalf. Um, I have a student as I had mentioned to you earlier, that's going into ICA competition this summer in Orlando. And I have put a lot of hours in on that one student, preparing them for the audition, the tape, uh, all the rehearsals, nitpick, every little tiny thing has to be perfect Mm -hmm. when they go make that recording. Um, Well, I think it's good to find your niche. I mean, you know, you don't want to be, you can't teach everybody. uh, Right. Just because someone is willing to sort of take on a student that is not willing to take, you know, almost the clarinet seriously doesn't mean that you should. And I think that you, you have to sort of find that for yourself as a teacher. Um, I mean, I know that, for example, do you know Michelle Anderson out in Vancouver there? She's yes. got this website and uh, she focuses on like adult clarinet beginners. Mentors. And it's yeah. a fantastic yeah. little niche for her to teach out of. And, and uh, but that's where she sort of, she likes that. She really uh-huh. identifies with those people. So if you can find the, the students that you can can teach with, it's it's probably better. And from a marketing perspective, I'd like your, your thought on this, but if you work with people that you do your best work with, they're going to recommend you, you know. But if you're not in it and you're not happy with someone that you're working with, you won't do your best work and then they will view you as not as good as you could be and you'll get few recommendations. So what do you think about that sort of whole snowballing? I, I hear what you're saying. Um, again, I 
target my students in a very small circle. It's mm-hmm. those students who are very serious and are intent on pursuing careers as professional clarinetists. That keeps me going. That fuels my energy so that I can do my marketing at that high level. Mm -hmm. I have to teach at a high level. I have to perform at a high level. And I have to market at a high level. How do you reach students? I am uh, contacted. They get in touch with me. It's all by referral. So, like, are you in contact with the directors of these orchestras then, or how does No. Um, I've been living in Seattle for 28 years now. So you're just well-known. I'm just very well-known, and if somebody wants me, they'll call me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's so it's so funny, because, I mean, sometimes there are no, no tricks to things. you just got to you gotta be there in the thick of things and know people, <laughs> you know? And, and if you've made a name for yourself, that is kind of how you get known through music. So um, for those who are listening, just starting out, I mean, it's I think it's about kind of putting in the time and, and to some extent, and... Uh, putting out the feelers and, and meeting people and getting your name out there. Um, so speaking of, you know, lessons, let's, let's talk a little bit about your sort of musical upbringing and, and education a bit. Mm-hmm. You had the chance to study with um, several of the 20th century's biggest clarinet names, including Sad. Harold Wright and Peter Hadcock. Is there any compelling moment or story you'd like to share on the podcast? Uh, well, many, but <laughs> we'd be here all night, Sean. Um, but there are other teachers that I've enjoyed working with um, at Boston Conservatory, uh, Pasquale Cardillo, mm-hmm. uh, Attilio Poto, and uh, Robert Marcellus in New York. Mm. Um, and uh, all of the teachers have been just outstanding. Uh, Joe Contino, when I was at the University of Massachusetts, uh, as a graduate assistant there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Joe Viola with Berkeley, because uh, I was really into jazz when I was going to school in Boston. Oh, really? I was very active as a jazzist, and uh, not, a lot, not a lot of people know that. Um, but I was into the Eric Dolphy thing and the Benny Goodman oh, yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, Eric Dolphy. Played with the Bo Winnaker jazz band. Uh, <laughs> so um, I always try to think young and creative and put all those creative juices to work uh, as many different ways as I can. And I think clarinetists, the um, the more creative they can be, the more directions they can go, Mm -hmm. the more opportunities will open up for them. So what's a moment then, um, I'm not sure which teacher it would be with, maybe multiple teachers, but what was a moment that really had the greatest impact on you in your education? Well, I think think Buddy Wright was Mm -hmm. probably the biggest for me. Um, Such an incredible man. uh, his his energy and his his direct. Mm-hmm. He was a very direct person, but soft spoken, yeah. and um, played with a double lip. Oh, uh, do you? No, oh. I I tried, but I just just yeah, me too. It's did, not I just couldn't get it. Yeah, it's never felt comfortable to me. Which I know you just need to put in the time, but it seems right. like a lot of time to relearn something. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, but he was the one that really put the orchestral excerpts in my mm-hmm. in my library under my fingers. Um, all the hours that we spent on that. Um, Attilio Poto. I don't know if many of you know or have heard of him. He was a premier. Uh, uh, teacher at Boston Conservatory. This is back in the late seventies. Uh, Michael Nosweather, if you're out there, I know you know who he is. Yes, yes. I just uh, talked to Michael at ICA this last summer. Got to know him. Um, he's, he's doing. He's been on the podcast episode two, I believe. Yeah, he's doing fantastic things over yeah. there at BCM. Um, and then um, here in Seattle, Bill McCall. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took a couple lessons from Bill Smith mm. uh, yeah. a few years back. Uh, so there's been some pretty, pretty incredible teachers that have added to my cultural diversity in the clarinet. What was clarinet it like life. with Bill, studying with Bill Smith a little bit? Well, Bill Smith was a fancy in passing. I just moved from Se- uh, Boston to Seattle, and mm-hmm. I wanted to. I was still in my jazz thing, and I wanted to get some insight on some of his compositions. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he was just kind of laid back and. Uh, I played for him, and he liked what I did. He kind of just shared a little insight with me. He, he's an amazing. He's ninety now. Oh yeah, did you he's, know that? he's still. He's and he's still going he's strong. Still playing. He's still active. He's yeah. awesome. And uh, you know, he's there's a few uh, 
there seems to be actually a high density of clarinetists in Seattle that are all of yeah. you know, compelling yeah. um, interest for me mm-hmm. for the podcast anyways, but I uh, only, only hear so much time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it would be great to, to, to find a way to connect with him. But uh, amazing that at that age, he's still still going strong. He it's is, great to yeah. See. Yeah, and Bill, Bill McColl uh, was another inspiration. He was with the Seattle Symphony mm-hmm. principal many years ago. So tell me a little bit about... Um, Because I didn't expect the conversation to go in this direction, but here we are. Uh, Let's go. (laughs) (laughs) Improvisation and jazz. So I'm curious, like, how did that kind of... You want to (laughs) know. Okay. Yeah, let's let's go digging. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Oh, geez. Well, um, when I was growing up, uh, I I grew up in a very uh, moderate income family, and um, as soon as my parents had realized that I was... Uh, interest in the clarinet. My dad went out and bought me a lot of Benny Goodman records. Mm-hmm. And um, so I would listen to Benny Goodman for hours and I would learn all his solos. Uh, no music. I would just learn I'd, by playing the, the, the song over and over just and over ear? again. Just by ear? Just by ear. And that was an amazing uh, th- uh, experience for me because it taught me how to listen to like Brahms, how to interpret Brahms. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, without looking at the music, I think once you pull away from the music, you can separate that. Um, gives you a different depth and dimension and perspective on what these composers wanted. Yeah. Um, so I, well, I, I, I learned, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, too, because like the element of the cadenza in, in classical repertoire, I mean, that we've sort of lost in modern times anyways, it seems, some of the connection to improvisation and how natural that is within the musical context. Um, and I sometimes think it's sort of too bad nowadays that most people just play the transcribed cadenzas. They should make their own cadenza. <laughs> well, and it's true. Um, back in the 70s, everything was Breikoff and Hertel. Mm-hmm. That was the publisher. Was, everything was was Breikoff. Now there's so many different publishers and editions out there. Yeah. The cadenzas um, have been changed dramatically. Um, and I think it's wonderful um, that that we have this option to to explore different venues for playing the cadenza instead of just one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Straight format. So for me, when I started learning about improvisation, it was rather late for me, but I found it actually reduced some of my performance anxiety because I knew, this sounds a bit weird, but like if I got into a funk, I could get out of it because, I don't know, you're, you're only ever really a semitone away from a right note and you can, <laughs> you know, yeah. get your way back. And it, it sort of eased some of my performance anxiety because I was like, oh, if I miss a note, like it's not... The world is an ending kind of thing, you know. It's not like the train sort of wrecks and it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's over. Um, are you saying then that improvisation or listening to these solos and stuff kind of came before your more intense classical training and it, it helped you in that regard? Absolutely. Or, yeah. Absolutely. Um, listening to, to jazz um, by the jazz masters mm-hmm. really, I, I honestly feel, and maybe some people will disagree, I feel it's an enhancement on your ability to play all different kinds of music mm-hmm. and interpret. Um, and since, like we were talking, all the countries I've traveled to, um, a few years ago I was in Samoa, and I went there to study the voice. And like singing? Singing, oh. yeah. And uh, these women, these these huge Samoan women would would get out there and they'd in and, and the sidewalks of the streets and they'd sing these beautiful enchanting songs and their voices were high and kind of eerie and the the kind of wisp wisp away and then you'd have the low booming voices of the men come in. So it was like this marimba, uh, you know, we had the the low range of the marimba, we had the the high uh, prickly pear like uh, of the xylophone, for example, coming together, and how they would blend the textures. It's, it's. I know it's hard to explain um, to all of you out there, but it really helps you um, as a clarinetist to voice, learn mm-hmm. how to voice your sound and how to carry a phrase and how to play through a phrase and blow through a line. So are you saying that the voices were sounding like a marimba? Well, or they were using that with the voices? No, the, the, the voice. Okay, so the voices were sounding. Like like a marimba, kind of a smooth tunnel. Like mm. when when you play the clarinet, I, I think of a clarinet. I wrote this down in here in an earlier article, where I feel this smooth tube. You're blowing through a tube. Clarinet's an object. Yeah. And you're blowing through a smooth tube, and it's your your goal to control that object, and yeah. create with it. And that's what they do with their voices. 
So what is your concept of the clarinet tone then? You sound like you have a very sort of refined mentality on how how you play. Well, um, I, um, yeah, I do like the, uh, like like I say, I, I, I try to think of a long tube blowing the air out through the end of the instrument, mm-hmm. um, kind of like a Samoan singer would be. Um, and I feel like the force when I take a breath that my my lungs press down, my diaphragm presses up, and that creates an infinite tunnel of air that's continuously going. What I push out of the instrument comes back to me. Hmm. And so you're kind of using the resistance to your advantage. Well, yeah, of course, but the resistance is more of a mechanical thing yeah. in your equipment. But, um, you know, I've, I've had many teachers say, like, um, I even had Buddy Wright say, play from the diaphragm. Mm-hmm. You know, use your use this. And it's actually um, the abdomen and diaphragm are coming together like an accordion. Mm-hmm. You know, one pushes down, one pushes up. As you take in air, that pushes the lungs down. The diaphragm, as you release, pushes up. Mm-hmm. And that creates this, this continuous airstream, which has to be warm, I think of it as because of, of all the tropics, warm tropical air. <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. And pushing. Playing is, wa- playing is always a vacation, a little. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Why not? So, playing warm tropical air, pushing this warm air through the instrument, warms up the, the wood, uh, warms up your fingers, warms up the mouthpiece, conditions the reed, and gets everything mm-hmm. so that you have that control, that you're in control of that object that's that you have in your possession. Hmm. And so, one more question before we move on to the. Uh, I definitely want to get to the Ubel clarinets and the, the ESM mouthpiece that we're also here to talk about. Um, but your interest in jazz has sort of piqued my interest as to what your feelings on vibrato are. Because I know that a lot of classically oriented players, and we've debated this on other episodes of the podcast, but um, right or wrong, some people are very opposed to using vibrato and others are thinking it's a necessary part of the technique. So where, where do you sit in that sort of debate? Or Well, I'm pro and con. Um, the Rhapsody in Blue, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. Um, Brahms, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mozart, no. Yeah. Um, so it really all depends. Um, I think the vibrato, if if it's done in the right place in the right time, the right situation, can be very very nice. But it's very it's a very fine line. If it's done in the wrong situation, mm-hmm. it can ruin a piece. And so why do you think that, um, like I understand the contextual argument too, I agree actually, but uh, why do you think the instruments like, for example, the flute can basically get away with it everywhere? Is it just more built into their technique as an instrument or their history or? Well, I mean, if you go back to uh, Rum Paul mm-hmm. or bowling um, uh, or any, uh, I'm not really up on latest jazz flutists. Um, I have a very good friend, Anne Drummond, that um, I went to school with and she's, way up there in the flute world now, mm-hmm. living in New York. And she ha- plays the, a lot of vibrato in her mm-hmm. sound. And it's very nice. She's uh, She's got a, a good control and good improvisation. Yeah. And I, I think that's fine with flute, um, but not with clarinet. I, I think the clarinet's kind of the, the dividing line. Um, you can when, when the time is right. Yeah. <laughs> like so many things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so many musical choices. Yes. So speaking of musical choices, um, you recently have started using the Ubel clarinets, um, switched from Buffet, and and uh, this has been something you've quite enjoyed. Would you tell me a little bit about your experience with these instruments and, and what you love about them and what they've sort of done for you as an artist? Yes. I grew up playing buffets, and just recently, within the last three years, I had the fortunate um, experience to meet uh, Victoria Mo and Andreas and get to know the Ubel clarinet family. Um, This was at Baton Rouge in 2014. And um, at the time, I really knew nothing about the instrument uh, other than when I played it, I fell in love with it. Um, It was like love at first sight. Mm -hmm. And um, the more I got to play it, it kind of my, I felt all these things that I had to do to change my, my, my thought, my thinking about buffets to, to Ubel's. When you play something, you know, it's like when you first play it, oh, great. And then 
when you play it continuously, you say, oh, what am I doing? Well, this isn't quite right. This doesn't sound right. I need to change. So all these little details come into to play now. Mm-hmm. Um, the the Yubel is a larger board instrument. And um, so when you're playing a larger board like uh, oh, the um, Schrenk Kolbe or the, um, I'm thinking, um, the Euler, Oscar Euler, um, it, all those German clarinets have a larger, uh, more larger capacity, a darker sound. If you're using, if you're used to using the same equipment that you used on your buffet, and you switch to a Ubel, probably going to be a little bit, a little bit disappointed, mm-hmm. because that change, it's it's something you have to kind of make an adjustment with your reeds. So what what kind of adjustments specifically then for those who might be interested in trying this? A larger mouthpiece um, uh, with a medium closed tip opening, Mm -hmm. such as the Blue Heavens. So larger, you mean like the chamber of the mouthpiece is literally larger? The chamber is larger, yes. Mm, And the baffle is a little deeper. Uh, Okay. okay. The rails are a little bit shorter and the tip opening is more medium closed than medium open. Mm. and using a reed with a thick vamp. Oh, okay. Um, on my reeds, I, I, I've tried every reed machine in, in on the market for all these years, <laughs> and I always come back to one thing: sandpaper. Oh, really? And for adjusting. Perhaps. For adjusting reed, for minute adjusting, I use a three twenty medium grit for the shaping of the reed, and then I use the six hundred a wet dry sandpaper for the polishing. So you, um, you're a Diderio artist, correct? That's correct. So you must be using the, the classic then, the, the red box? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm using that. Um, I use a variety of reeds. Um, I'm also, I've tried the Legere mm-hmm. um, and the, the Van Dorn Black Masters. Oh, I haven't tried those ones. Isn't that the German box That's, that's the German. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they also come in a, a white yeah, Masters, seen... uh, which is really hard for me. Those are all very hard to find here in general. I oh maybe it's just in Canada, but nobody yeah. carries those. But on the Rico Reserve, um, I like uh, I play on fours. Oh wow! And so I I've got to have that thick vamp so that I can have enough cane that I have time to shape it. So you play a four, but then you file it down a little bit. And, mm-hmm. Oh, so okay. Yeah. Because yeah, I've recently switched to using softer reeds. I found that I just couldn't. I didn't want to blow so hard anymore. <laughs> so I, right. Because I sort of came up with a Van Dorn M15 kind of concept and, and like I had a Greg Smith mouthpiece also that was very, very close. Oh, I, but I had Greg Smith. Unfortunately, yeah, someone broke it <laughs> just, oh. <laughs> just before a concert. Um, that's another story. But but I used to use very hard reads like four, four and a half with those. And I just found one day I was like, you know what? I have to change. <laughs> so, but uh, anyways. And so these, these instruments, which specific model um, – is the one that you prefer, or do you own several, or how does it? I have um, the classic. I have the Vantage and the Superiors, and next week I'm going to have their E flat clarinet, which I'm excited oh, about. Oh, is that new? That's brand new. Oh wow! Just uh, out in December. Amazing. So I'm excited to try that. What is it? Ba- which model is it based on, or does it kind of align with? Um, with the E flat. Yeah. I I think it's just uh, with the Prestige. No, but what I mean is, sorry, within their product line. Um, is oh, that oh, with the superior. The superior. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but anyway, getting back to the Ewells, um, the one thing I like about the the superiors is the registers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the F sharp. You know, like on a buffet, the F sharp is really kind of stuffy and sometimes flat. Are you talking about the one on top of the staff? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, with the Ewells, there's there's it's just free blowing. There's no resistance mm-hmm. um, as far as uh, trying to uh, adjust it. It just plays, which is really nice. Um, and I've had to make a lot of adjustments um, with my previous clarinets, mm-hmm. um, but very little once I got locked in with the mouthpiece and the reed and the ligature setup. I'm also playing um, a Silverstein cryo gold ligature, which I love. It's so funny that a ligature would have that much impact on the sound. Yeah, I haven't tried these extensively. I, I've just played them briefly at like Clarinet Fest or something. It's not the best place to try equipment, unfortunately. But um, I've heard so much about these these ligatures, and uh, 
could you go into a little bit about what's interesting about them? Like, why, how could it affect it so much? And I hear they have like a cryogenic freezing process or something. Oh, yeah. It seems seems yeah. a little space age for a yeah, planet. Yeah, it's <laughs> back to um, – Back to Mars in the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> Lost. I think there was a program called Lost in Space. I remember that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then they redid it about 20, 30 years later. Yeah. Yeah. It was one of my favorites. Um, a- anyway, um, so I, I don't know exactly what the specifics are, but they do freeze it to 300 and something below zero or something. Um, but what that does is, and then it's, it's got a gold weave inside. Oh, of the wire the that wire. goes around? Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that warms up as you play, so that allows the reed to vibrate more freely than some of the other ligatures. I've had, uh, I've had the Van Dorn. I've had a lot of Van Dorns. Um, I also have the uh, Rico H ligature, mm-hmm. yeah. which I still use. I like that. I use it more for... Um, uh, quintet, uh, woodwind quintet playing. Oh, okay. Um, but for the solo playing, my chamber music, I I go for the Silverstein ligatures. So those ones as well, I mean, you said you're with the gold one, right? Mm-hmm. I think they come in several materials. Is it a solid gold piece or is it it's, it's plated, I think, right? It's like a... It's, it's gold plated. Um, but then if you want the really top of the line, mm-hmm. you can pay... Uh, Twelve hundred dollars and get one with a diamond in it. Oh my God! <laughs> and gold or rose gold. Yeah, the, some of the prices are pretty amazing, but it's also uh, pretty you know impressive. It's awesome technology, yeah. but yeah. it'd be funny to tell a non clarinetist like, yes, my uh, you know this thing that's holding my reed that looks look, looks like a shoelace is fifteen hundred bucks or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I was um, uh, BK let me try the uh, the rose gold with the diamond in there. Yeah, and it was it was. Um, I, I got the thing on. I put it on, and I just I couldn't believe it. it was like amazing. So I started walking down the hall, playing all these runs and everything, you know. And everybody was stopping and looking at me, like, "Is she okay?" I, <laughs> I just I just took off, you know. BK was like, "Oh, Marianne, <laughs> don't, don't go away." Yeah, they need so, a little alarm. We want our ligature back. You <laughs> yeah, know? we're gonna need that. <laughs> but you know, there's, there might be some logic to that because, well, I would hope so. Um, but the density of the ligature itself is apparently what kind of affects the vibration of the reed as well. So um, I'd like to more, know more about the science about it, but I could imagine that attaching something extremely dense like a diamond to the gold would actually increase the overall density of the, the item, obviously. Yeah. Right. Um, like, again, like I said, um, uh, they're not for everybody, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have had so many positive experiences with it because it just frees up the reed. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, it opens up your sound. Uh, the intonation is automatically locked in. Uh, there's no uh, no resistance going over the brakes. Uh, it's just a really great, great ligature to have. Fantastic. So, Marianne, it's been great to talk with you today. Before we wrap up, I'd like to quickly bring the return of the lightning round. And your listeners might be wondering where these went for a while. I I stopped asking these quick questions at the end, but I actually got some requests to bring them back because people were finding the the book suggestions and things like that really valuable. So here we go. This is uh, Back to the Lightning Round with Marianne Lakai <laughs> here. And uh, if you're not familiar with, with what this is, it's just five or six quick questions at the end, all to be answered in under a minute. So let's start with the first one. Okay. If, if you were to have a – or sorry, if I were to have a peek at your music stand right now, what would I find on it? Well, you would find all four of the Krebs studies, all of the Yerl books, the Jean Jean studies, the Janine Roof studies, the Delacruz Grand Etudes, 14 of them, and the Eugene Gay Etudes Recapitulation. I usually stack all those books on my stand, and then I pick one book and play through as many of those during that practice session as I can. Also, one thing I do is I always set my video recorder up and I record myself every time I practice. Oh, interesting. I think that's very, very important for critiquing your progress and I think listening, teaching you to listen more carefully about what you play and and, uh, how you can improve. What is one instrument that you always have wanted to play but but have never tried or, or don't play? Well, it's the clarinet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Other than the clarinet. <laughs> yeah, other than the clarinet. Um, I did uh, play piano for a, a couple of years. 
Uh, my mother was a pianist, a uh, concert pianist, and so I started when I was five on piano. Um, but Benny Goodman was really the, the one icon in my life that totally nailed it for me. I just wanted to play like Benny Goodman. So you do play the instrument you've always wanted to play. That's yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. um, which album or piece of music changed your life the most? Artie Shaw's Begin the Begin. <laughs> Um, uh, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, um, uh, this, their style of playing, it wasn't so much that they were playing in the swing era as their style and how they interpreted the music. So smooth, so flawless and so easygoing. And that's how I wanted to learn to play. And if you could meet any composer past or present and you could go back in time even and talk with them, who would it be? Copeland. Oh, interesting. I was expecting um, either Goodman yeah. or... Yeah, well, um, and actually, um, when I was in Boston, uh, I actually got to play in Tanglewood for two summers under the direction of the late Aaron Copeland. Oh, wow. And that was an incredible experience. I actually got to meet him, uh, but I didn't get to meet him. I, I, I got to work with him, but mm -hmm. that's that's one thing I, I regret that I never got to really sit down and, sit down and chat yeah. with a man. Wow, that's, that's amazing. What is one piece of advice that you would... Give to your 21-year-old self if you could. Oh, golly. That's a hard question, Sean. <laughs> um, I would um, say to start earlier, if, if, if I'm 21, um, know your goals. Uh, I know when you're 20, it's, it's like the whole world is on a string for you. Um, but um, the world doesn't pay you to go to school. The world pays you for what you know. Mm, I like that. And uh, that's my advice to all. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, where can listeners find you online? Have you got a website, Twitter handle? Of course, I'll put this on the show notes, but just, yeah, just yeah, shout yeah. it out there. Okay. <laughs> well, marianlakai.net's my website. That's M-A-R-Y-A-N-N-E-L-A-C-A-I-L-L-E.net. And there's uh, I'm on YouTube as well. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, and thank you so much for hosting me in, in Seattle here. And thanks again to our engineers, uh, Joel in the studio there. And um, the name of this studio has escaped me all of a sudden. I'm Jack embarrassing Straw. Me. Jack Straw. Jack Straw <laughs> Studio. We're here in Seattle. So thank you so much, and uh, this has been fantastic. Thank, thank you, Sean. Thanks for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. For free content updates, coupons, and a chance to win giveaways mentioned on the show, please be sure to enter your email address at clarinet.com slash subscribe. The podcast is brought to you in part by the generous support of its listeners. If you'd like to learn how you can help out, please see clarinet.com slash support. Today's episode was brought to you by Dario Woodwinds. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is refining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with the world's most innovative techniques, so you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds. <laughs>